This video is in collaboration with Epidemic Sound. Hello filmmaker, welcome back. If you're new, I'm Monica Bryant and this channel is a living document of my journey as a filmmaker. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, theys and thems, today we are doing something a little bit different. This video will kick off the beginning of a series where we are taking a ridiculously unhinged deep dive into the Buffyverse. I am a diehard fan for life. I have loved Buffy the Vampire Slayer since I was in a single digit age and I watched the movie for the first time. Before I get started, I'm just gonna have to address the elephant in the room. It has recently come out that Joss Whedon is problematic. He is not the feminist, woman-loving guy that we thought he was, that he portrayed himself to be. Allegedly, he has been extremely problematic, not only on his recent superhero movie sets, but on the Buffy TV show itself. Allegedly, he has said and done a lot of things that aren't very cool. But despite all that in this series of videos, we are just going to have to separate the artist from their art. You do what you gotta do to make it. If you are a person who consumes art, the artist is probably problematic, even if you don't know about it yet. That's just the risk you take when you consume art and become a fan of something. If you would like for me to do a video about Joss Whedon and all of his allegations and all the weird little things that he's done, on set and the way he's treated actors and actresses. I would be happy to do that. Let me know in the comments, just say, hey Monica, do the Joss Whedon video and I will do the video because I do have thoughts and opinions and I, I think I'm ready to go down that rabbit hole and see exactly what he did because it wasn't good. It's not good stuff. Spoiler alert, I will be spoiling the 1992 Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie starring Christy Swanson. So if you have not seen the movie yet, you've had 30 years to watch this movie. I will also be spoiling the 1999 Buffy the Origin comic, which was released as an adaptation of Joss Whedon's original screenplay. I'm so excited. <laughs> Epidemic Sound is a global music tech company empowering creators to elevate their content and engage their audience with an ever-expanding catalog of world-class music and sound effects. And now, you can go from silence to the perfect soundtrack in seconds. With Epidemic Sound's new AI-powered Soundmatch feature, soundtracking like a pro has never been easier. Soundmatch lets you go from a rough cut or clip to discovering the perfect soundtrack for your project in no time. Soundmatch works by analyzing your video's frames and delivers a curated selection of soundtracks that will take it to the next level. Just play your video and get a tailor-made music recommendation for each scene. That means no more endless browsing for the perfect soundtrack. Here I just have some drone footage. When I upload it and click Soundmatch, it curates a selection of tracks I can choose from. by signing up for a 30-day free trial at Epidemic Sound. Use the link in my description. Now back to the video. So let's talk about the Buffy the Vampire Slayer film. How did this movie get made? About 10 years ago, I uh, had an idea for a movie. Um, I'd seen a lot of horror movies, which I love very much, uh, with uh, blonde girls getting themselves killed in dark alleys, and I just germinated this idea about how much I'd like to see a blonde girl go into a dark alley, get attacked by a big monster, and then kill it. And um, that was sort of the genesis for the idea of the movie, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh hey, it's me, I'm back, and I'm wearing different clothes. 
hot. I had to run and get my notes because there's so many things that I want to talk about and I didn't want to forget about anything. So if you see me looking down like that, is because I don't have a teleprompter. As some of you may know, Joss Whedon is a third generation Nepo baby. His grandfather wrote for shows like the Donna Reed Show and Leave It to Beaver. And his father, Tom Whedon, wrote for the Dick Cavett Show, Alice, Benson, and some other stuff. Before moving on to major success, when Joss was an unknown, he wrote Alien Resurrection and he wrote on Toy Story, which was nominated for an Oscar. And then he got the job as a writer on Roseanne and for Parenthood, which is based on a movie. Joss grew up in Manhattan. He went to school in Winchester, which is an all boys school in England. When he came back to the States, he went to Wesleyan College in Connecticut. And then after a year of writing spec scripts, Joss was hired on Roseanne. This is a direct quote from him. He said, I went from working at a video store on Friday to working at Roseanne on Monday. And it's like, sure Joss, and you being a third generation wealthy Nepo baby had absolutely nothing to do with that. Okay. <laughs> Fran Rubel and her husband Kaz Kazui own Kazui Enterprises. It is one of the largest independent motion picture distribution companies in Japan. Fran knew from the time she was 12 years old that she wanted to make movies. She was the president of her drama club in school and she directed all the plays according to her. All of them. Nobody else got to direct. It was just Fran. It was a one woman show apparently. She went to NYU where she took film classes. One of the assignments for her class was to write a treatment for a TV show and that treatment caught the eye of one of her professors. The professor had just been named the head of PBS Public Affairs and he hired Fran to work for him after her graduation just based on that treatment alone. So really lucky girl. After three weeks of working at PBS, she became an associate producer in the public affairs department where she produced documentaries. Has anybody else been promoted after three weeks working anywhere? I just want to know, like, how, how you do that? Where they do that at? Fran went on to produce educational films for Encyclopedia Britannica, and that is where she met the renowned film director Milos Forman. He directed Amadeus in 1984 and won an Academy Award for that. He also did One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Hair, The People vs. Larry Flint, critically acclaimed films, and he invited her to work for him. She became his personal assistant, and on the side, he was teaching her how to be a script coordinator. Fran went on to write and direct the 1988 film, Tokyo Pop. I've never seen it. Maybe I'll check it out, I don't know. It did receive critical acclaim at the Cannes Film Festival, and then she produced Orgasmo, that was a Matt Parker and Trey Stone film. Fran almost had the chance to direct Cool Runnings, but because she's not the one that optioned the script, she lost that and it went to somebody else. Maybe that was a good thing. <laughs> she lost that opportunity. She was really down in the dumps about it. So she goes to this birthday party. She runs into Howard Rosenman. At the time, he was the co-president of production at Sand Dollar. Sand Dollar will be important later. So he tells her about this script by Joss Whedon called Buffy the Vampire Slayer that's been floating around Hollywood, right? And here's the real tea. The real tea is that nobody wanted to make this movie. Joss Whedon's original script was a mix of satire and action and movie studios, even back then in the 90s, did not like it when you mix genres. They didn't like it when you tried to do something new. And as we've seen today that had progressively gotten worse with the number of remakes that they're now spewing. They just hate new ideas. They don't want to do anything new. They're scared. Because Fran was married to Kaz Kazooie and they had Kazooie Enterprises, which means they had some money. She liked the script. She said, and I went, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Okay, I'll do it. And he said, well, how do you know? And I went, well, it's so stupid. I'll do it. She hadn't even read it and said yes. And then after she read it, she said she loved it and it was funny and she just laughed and laughed and then she wanted to make it. And that is how it started. Fran Kazooie 
it turned out she didn't really like Joss Whedon's script as much as she said she did because she made him do a bunch of rewrites. She said, and I quote, as we rewrote it, there were several times I said to Joss, Oh, that's such a silly thing for her to say. Could we take that out? And Josh said, but I said that myself when I was in high school. For me, what I wanted to do in the movie was balance the scary and funny. I think at that point, Josh's vision was more toward scary, but he was incredibly supportive of what I wanted to do and refocused the script more along the lines of my vision and how I wanted to make the movie. Yeah, girl, because you were footing the bill. He had to do what you told him. You were literally paying for this. She wanted to add more jokes, make it more camp. That was not Joss Whedon's intent at all, but you know, what could he do? She was offering the money to pay for all this. And I think maybe at the time, even being a third generation Nepo baby, he was kind of broke. All the rewriting and then getting it green lighted and all that stuff took six months, which is lightning fast for anything in Hollywood. Now let's talk about the cast. Some of the hottest young actresses of the time wanted to play Buffy in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. They had considered Alyssa Milano. She was very interested, but for some reason it didn't work out. They never say why. Drew Barrymore was also another choice. She ended up declining the role. And Alicia Silverstone really wanted to play Buffy but she was too young. She was only 16. There's another 16 year old that is in the movie. We'll talk about that later. So the role eventually went to 22 year old Christy Swanson. She'd been acting in commercials since she was nine years old. I'd already seen Christy Swanson in Mannequin 2 on the move. I love that movie. I love the Mannequin 2 movie. Like I saw Mannequin 1 and it's fine, but the Christy Swanson Mannequin 2 movie is so good. It was one of my favorite movies as a child. And so when I saw Buffy, I was like, oh, that's the girl from Mannequin. And then years later, I watched Flowers in the Attic, which is really sad and horrible and traumatic. It's based on a novel. I, I do recommend it if you haven't seen it, but it's sad. So you've been warned. Fun fact about Christy Swanson is that she's a soft-spoken conservative. She mostly keeps her political views to herself, except the one time where she was in a play called Obamagate. The play consists of text emails, memos, and congressional testimony between two top officials at the FBI who were caught trying to smear Trump's campaign. You can watch a taping of this play on YouTube, just Google, Obamagate the movie Christy Swanson and it'll be the first thing that pops up if you're interested in that. Buffy has a collection of popular friends in the movie. We have Kimberly who's played by Hilary Swank. You might know her from her Oscar winning bangers Boys Don't Cry and Million Dollar Baby. This was her first feature role. 16 year old Hilary Swank cast next to 22 year old Christy Swanson. She was filming Camp Wilder in the daytime and then going and filming Buffy at night. It was an, a really exciting time for her. She was quoted in saying about director Fran Rubel Kazooie, it was nice working with a female when they're so rare and few and far in between. She started my career in movies, I guess, by hiring me on my first one. She even gave birth to fraternal twins back in April of this year at the age of 48. I mean, life finds a way. Am I right, ladies? About Hilary Swank, I also want to note, I think it's interesting that Hilary Swank's character is the only one in the movie that's not a cheerleader. She's not on the cheer squad, but she's still friends with the cheerleaders. But as they're cheering, she's just kind of in the audience, like watching them. And I always thought that was an interesting choice because that's not what they do in the comic. Jennifer is played by 26 year old Michelle Abrams. Out of all these girls, like Hilary Swank is the only one that's actually a teenager, which I think is really funny. Michelle Abrams plays Jennifer. She's a shallow follower of the group, no original thoughts of her own. And she started her career with a small part in the 1990 horror movie Troll 2. If you don't know what Troll 2 is, I do recommend it. It is usually considered one of the worst horror movies of all time. Her last known credit is in a TV show replacing dad in 1999. I couldn't find anything about her on the internet. She's not dead, right? But I don't know, she, she stopped acting. Then we have Nicole, 
who's played by Paris Vaughn, who was 31 years old at the time, 31 years old, playing a high school student. I mean, black don't crack sometimes. Paris Vaughn is a familiar face in the 90s. She was on a bunch of different TV shows. She was on A Different World. She was on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And she was on an episode of The Wayans Brothers in 1995. That was the same year where she married the Canadian former hockey player, Russ Courtnall. And they have three kids. So she's living her best life and, and stopped acting after that. So then we move on to Donald Sutherland, who played Merrick. He's Buffy's watcher and mentor. And the actor is famously embarrassed to be part of this film. I couldn't bring myself to say I was making a film called Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He didn't even want to tell people that he was doing it. And it's also rumored that Joss Whedon did not like his interpretation of the character. And it was one of the many reasons why he decided to step away and separate himself from the film because he couldn't stand Donald Sutherland. It's just sad. It was just a paycheck for him, you know? And rather than taking it seriously, he was just kind of funny sometimes. Sutherland previously starred in Backdraft alongside Kurt Russell, Billy Baldwin, and Robert De Niro. Universal Studios used to have that attraction, Backdraft. The Backdraft Experience that opened in 1992. And it was so cool because you stand in the middle of a burning room. Like the room was on fire. It was very hot in there also. But you would stand in the middle of this room and it was just on fire. And it was the coolest thing. I miss it. I honestly miss it, but I, I understand things have to get updated. Donald Sutherland was born in 1935, which I think is like, that's cool. Cause we don't, we don't have a lot of people left from the 1930s. So we should probably treasure them. Um, his acting career spans from the early sixties to present day. So he's still very much in the acting world. Then we have Lothos, which is Buffy's nemesis played by Rutger Hauer. He sadly passed away in July of 2019 at the age of 75. He built his acting career playing romantic leads, action heroes, villains. One of his best known roles is that of Roy Batty in the 1982 action drama Blade Runner. I like Rutger Hauer in this movie. I thought he was menacing. I thought he took the material that he was given and he did his thing. It's not his fault that the movie didn't do well. Don't blame Rutger. Paul Rubens plays Amelin, a sidekick to Lothos. I spent a lot of time watching Pee Wee Herman as a kid, Pee Wee's Playhouse and then Pee Wee's Big Adventure. I loved his show, I loved his movies. And when he got cast in this film, he was fresh off of his allegations for a lewd public act where he like exposed himself in a theater. He was charged with public indecency. He had to do community service. And one of the things that he was required to do was an anti-drug ad. This is crack, rock cocaine. It isn't glamorous or cool or kid stuff. When he walked on set, he cracked a joke about getting in trouble for that lewd act and it just kind of like alleviated the tension. He was a really funny person. Everybody liked working with him. Like no one had anything bad to say about Paul Rubens. He was a funny guy. He also added a lot of comedy into the film. Paul Rubens is great. He's great in this movie. It's not his fault either that the movie didn't do well. I 1000% blame Fran, but okay. Then we have Pike played by the late great Luke Perry who also passed away in 2019. The number of people who have died in this movie is just, it's sad. It makes me sad. He joked about being the damsel in distress to Buffy's hero. I watched him in 90210 when I was a kid and I would fantasize about what high school might be like. He was also Archie's dad in Riverdale and his last role before he passed away was in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So Luke Perry's great. He's hot. He's fun to watch. He's awesome. And Benny, played by David Arquette, before he was unmasking killers in the Scream series, he played Pike's best friend. And David Arquette is also just funny and bubbly in the film. He ends up uh, turning into a vampire, but when Scream first came out and I saw David Arquette, I was like, oh my God, that's Benny from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. She said to no one. So those cameos that I was talking about from notable actors. So we have in this film, and I made a list. 
We have Steven Root. He plays a counselor. He's a, a notable voice actor and also Milton from Office Space. There's a cameo from Thomas Jane, the Punisher. We have uh, Mark DiCarlo, the comedian, and he plays the basketball coach. And his whole idea was to just not know what he was doing. And also Alexis Arquette, which is David Arquette's sister, who's like a vampire DJ. And she passed away in 2016, but... She did have a fun role in Bride of Chucky. Then we have Ricky Lake, talk show host and the star of the 1988 film Hair. Cassandra is played by Natasha Gregson Wagner. If she has a familiar looking face, that is because she is the daughter of Natalie Wood. But I've always known her as Michelle Mancini from Urban Legend. She's the girl that gets killed off in the very beginning of the film. And Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck, ladies and gentlemen, in his first feature film role, he had a small role as a basketball player. There's a funny clip of him talking about his time on set because I did not know that they dubbed his voice. I had one line and I just say, give the ball. And I think I say, take it, man. And I thought it was fine. And the director seemed happy. Harsh. I went to the movie and I was like, that is not my voice. <laughs> that, that is not me. <laughs> Apparently the director hated my performance so much that she looped the entire performance. And this is what Fran had to say about him. It's a little disrespectful. It was his first film and he kept coming up to me and asking what his motivation is. It was a really hard day because I don't know how to play basketball. And I went, I'm going to remember this guy. And if he ever shows up at a casting call, I'm going to really have to avoid him because he has a lot of questions as an actor. (laughs) Little did she know that he would become one of the most successful actors in Hollywood. So take that, Fran. They had five weeks to get this film made. And instead of Fran going in there with the clear vision that she claimed to have, she just let everybody do whatever they want. She just basically told the actors to figure it out for themselves. Even Christy Swanson was frustrated because she wasn't used to working like that. She was used to a director being hands-on and being involved. And now I'm going to quote from Wikipedia because my teachers and professors never let me. According to Wikipedia, a film director is a person who controls a film's artistic and dramatic aspects and visualizes the screenplay while guiding the film crew and actors in fulfillment of that vision. And how did Fran Rubel Kazooie handle being a film director? The decision I made was to let people do their own thing. As Fran Rubel Kazooie encouraged cast and crew to make their own choices, some members of the team began to take issue with her freewheeling and improvisational approach. Fran liked making up the shot in the moment, and that meant we didn't know exactly what we were gonna be looking at was sort of left up to their own devices in a way to figure out what to do. Ah, let the movie figure itself out. Even Fox Studios was getting frustrated with Fran. They wanted her to punch up the horror. She was just making the movie funny in a corny sort of way that just wasn't gonna do well. And Fox Studios said, make the movie scarier, make the movie scarier. And she just completely ignored them and did whatever she wanted to do. For somebody who had such strong opinions about Joss Whedon's writing and who claimed to have such a clear vision of what she wanted, it just was really weird to see her go into directing the film and then just completely let all that go and then tell the actors to do whatever they wanted. Like, She didn't think she had to give anybody direction and she didn't. And so because of that, chaos ensued. And I don't know the exact happenings because, you know, obviously I wasn't there. But rumor has it that Joss Whedon and other people were getting upset and were just like, this is awful. Like some people just didn't have a great time on set, allegedly. So now that you know the history of how this film got made, let's go into the film, see what happens, and then we can talk about how the audience received it.
The film opens with a flashback of Europe, the Dark Ages, where a menacing voiceover tells of the Slayer, one girl in all the world called to fight the forces of evil. She's got a gnarly birthmark, and when one Slayer dies, another is called. Fast forward to present day California, Buffy Summers is a high school senior at Hemery High in Los Angeles. She's a vapid, fashion-obsessed blonde bimbo and captain of the cheerleading team. Their mascot, the Hemery Hog. Buffy visits the mall with her friends, Kimberly, Jennifer, and Nicole. Buffy eyes a yellow leather jacket, but Kimberly and Jennifer do not approve. What do you think? Please, it's so five minutes ago. Yeah. Oh. On their way to the movies, they're accosted by a mysterious old man in a trench coat. In the theater, the girls can't stop talking and end up in a petty argument with two guys seated behind them. Buffy's boyfriend Jeffrey pulls up with his friends, Andy and Gruler. Gruler takes off by himself and ends up becoming the first victim, killed by Amelyn. Buffy and Jeffrey cozy up on the couch after her parents leave for the weekend. Buffy's mom calls Jeffrey Bobby. Bye bye, Bobby. Bye. She thinks my name is Bobby. It's possible she thinks my name is Bobby. Buffy dreams of a demon fighting slayer from the past and the vampire Lothos. Somewhere, Amelin promises his master that he will soon rise and make his claim. At school, Buffy and her friends brainstorm a socially conscious theme for the school dance. Downer! Later at a bar, why are these teens at a bar? Kimberly shows up wearing the leather jacket that Buffy was eyeing at the mall. What? I thought that look was over. Well, it's retro. Then the two guys from the theater show up and we learn their names are Benny and Pike. <laughs> You're the guys from the movie. <laughs> we hate you guys. Pike and Benny go for a late night drunken stroll. Pike passes out and Benny gets bitten and abducted by the vampire Amelin as trench coat man pulls up and saves Pike just in time. At the end of cheer practice, Buffy tells Jennifer she loaned Kimberly's leather jacket to Cassandra and not to tell her. Trench coat guy shows up, introduces himself as Merrick and asks Buffy to go with him to the graveyard so she can receive her birthright. She's been chosen. And of course, Buffy resists. You bear the mark of the coven. What, that big old hairy mole? <laughs> Ew, I had that thing removed. Merrick asks Buffy if she ever dreamt of being someone else, and she confesses that she always dreams of fighting a man, Lothos. Buffy goes to the graveyard with Merrick to wait for Robert Berman to rise from his grave. When vamps are near, Buffy gets stomach cramps. Two vampires rise, and after a struggle, Buffy stakes them both. Pike is awakened by Vampire Benny knocking at his window. When he realizes Benny is floating in midair, he tells him to leave. Merrick takes Buffy home and tells her to skip cheerleading practice and to meet him the next day. Buffy has a nightmare about Lothos. Cassandra is kidnapped by Amelin and Lothos and killed off screen. Buffy blows off meeting Merrick for cheerleading practice. Merrick shows up in the girls' locker room and Buffy tells him that he must have made a mistake. Then Merrick throws a knife at Buffy's head and she catches it, proving that she's the Slayer. She gets upset and punches him in the face. Then there's a training montage. Buffy tells Merrick that Lotho scares her. Buffy has a meeting with a guidance counselor, Gary Murray, and she kills a fly by blowing a thumbtack out of her mouth. Pike works on fixing his van so he can skip town. Buffy sticks a vamp in an alley. Merrick criticizes her tactics. Then they have a cute little moment where Merrick tells her he's lived hundreds of lives and has trained countless slayers. Pike's van breaks down and he has an encounter with Amelin and his goons. He narrowly escapes taking one of Amelin's arms when Buffy shows up to save him. Buffy takes Pike back to her place. Lothos chastises Amelin for allowing them to get away. Buffy's friends gossip about how Cassandra was found dead wearing Kimberly's jacket. She still had my jacket. The yellow leather? You didn't get that back from her? Oh, I'm so sorry. Andy makes a pass at Buffy in the hall and she flips. She storms out on her friends. Buffy shows up to cheer for the Riverview game, but ends up having to fight Grueler. She steals a motorcycle and chases him down. Pike sees her and follows on his own bike. They end up at the Pasadena Parade Float Storage Yard, where Pike stakes Grueler, and the two work together to fight off the other vamps. 
Lotho shows up with Amelyn and tries to put Buffy in a trance and asks if she's ready. Merrick shows up and says she's not. Then Lotho stakes him. Lothos and Amelyn leave because Buffy's not ready. Buffy's friends decorate for the school dance and gossip about the scene she made at the basketball game. Buffy shows up late once again and tries to confide in her friends about who she is and what's been going on, but they don't want to listen to her. They end up in a fight. Buffy goes shopping for a dress for the dance when Pike gives her crap for it because they should be out killing vampires. It's a senior dance. It's important. You wouldn't understand. No, I wouldn't understand. I mean, I thought you wanted to kill vampires. I don't want to kill anybody, okay? And I don't want to talk about this anymore. Benny overhears their argument and learns that Buffy is the Slayer. Buffy? Amelyn tells Lothos the Slayer's name, and Lothos declares they will wait until the dance on Saturday night to overtake her. Pike goes back to his apartment to sharpen stakes, shave, and get ready for the dance. Buffy shows up to the dance looking for Jeffrey because he never showed up to her house, but he's already at the dance with Jennifer. Pike shows up and they dance. You know, uh, Buffy, you're not like other girls. Soon, vampires crash the party. Buffy and Pike are thrown into fight mode. Buffy goes outside to fight and Amelyn shows up to the school. Back at the dance, the vampires have nearly taken over. Pike helps fight them off and Benny shows up to offer Pike eternal life. Buffy fights Amelyn and stakes him. Lothos appears with a violin to seduce Buffy into being bitten. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Pike kills Benny. Buffy snaps to her senses and she torches Lothos using her keen fashion sense. She goes back to the gym and Lothos shows up once again with a sword. They duke it out and she stakes him. The rest of the students leave and Buffy and Pike have a little dance before they ride off in the sunrise on his motorcycle together. Aww. With a budget of $7 million, Buffy the Vampire Slayer hit the domestic box office on July 31st, 1992, just six days after the start of the Summer Olympics. The film made $4.5 million in its opening weekend and overall grossed twice its budget at $16.6 million. Buffy sits at a 48 out of 100 on Metacritic. It has a total of 17 critic reviews, only two of which are mostly positive. Jay Scott from the Globe and Mail, who ranked it a 75, said, Buffy the Vampire Slayer should be a mess, but it's not. It's a mini comic triumph. And although it's technically a teen movie, it's in the tiny genre of sophisticated, darkly funny teen films, such as Heather's and Pump Up the Volume. An uncredited staff member at the Christian Science Monitor wrote, Moving from the dark ages of old Europe to the light ages of New California, this brash comedy pits a valley girl against a vampire. Christy Swanson heads the likable cast with Donald Sutherland and Paul Rubens in standout supporting performances. And of course, for balance, here's two of the worst reviews. William Arnold from the Seattle Post Intelligencer wrote, Director Fran Rubel Kazooie cannot begin to find the style that would give some unity and originality to this mess. The result is a grindingly dull horror comedy and an unnecessary satire of Valley Girls a full decade after the phenomenon has come and gone. And an uncredited staff member at Time wrote, Director Fran Rubel Kazooie's frenzied mistrust of her material is almost total. Somebody should have given her a garlic necklace or a mill town and told her to chill out. I had to look up what a mill town is. It's a tranquilizer. Many of the reviews can no longer be found online in their entirety. I'm assuming it's because they're from 1992, so the internet isn't forever after all, folks. Buffy the Vampire Slayer The Origin was published by Dark Horse Comics on September 15th, 1999.
According to the editor Scott Alley, established Buffy novelist Christopher Golden pitched an adaptation of Joss Whedon's original screenplay, minus the camp of the film, and done in the style of the TV show. There's also a quote from Joss Whedon. This quote was written in The Bronze, which was... I guess like a message board that they had in the 90s. I didn't have a computer in the 90s. I did not have access to this message board. I didn't even know this message board was a thing. But on the Wayback Machine, you can find some of it. This is what he had to say about the comic. The origin comic, though I have issues with it, can pretty much be accepted as canonical. They did a good job of combining the movie script, the script, with the series, and that was nice. And using the series Merrick and not a certain other thespian, referring to Donald Sutherland, who shall remain hated. Scathing words. If you have the Omnibus, Buffy the Vampire Slayer Omnibus Volume 1, it basically chronicles everything that happened to Buffy up until the point that she gets to Sunnydale. Immediately, the biggest difference is that in the comic, because the show had already started, they make Buffy look like Sarah Michelle Gellar. The vampires are also a lot more menacing, basically because when you're drawing a comic, you can take artistic liberties. However, in the movie, the vampires, they have fangs, but they also just kind of look like they drink too much fruit punch and stain their mouths. In the movie, Grueler is bitten by Amelin, abducted by him, and, and basically, you know, taken to the dark side. In the comic book, Grueler is bitten by a character named Wally Bessel. And Wally Bessel was a nerd at school that Grueler used to bully. So to get revenge, once he became a vampire, he went and bit his bully. Well, in the movie, that character was supposed to be played by Seth Green. However, his scene got cut from the film, but you can still see a picture of him on the back of the box of the VHS tape. But it's fine because he comes back. There's also no Nicole in the comic book. Buffy is only friends with Kimberly and Jennifer. There is a third girl that they're hanging out with, but she doesn't say much and she doesn't have a name. Also, Cassandra is just kind of like a girl that they know of. They're not really friends with Cassandra. In the film, Lothos ends up staking Merrick and killing him. But in the comic book, Lothos tries to intimidate Merrick by saying, I'm going to bite you and change you and then I'm gonna make you kill your slayer. And then he shoots himself. It's pretty graphic. I mean, I, I couldn't believe that that's originally what was supposed to happen. But in the comic, he kills himself. In the movie, Merrick tells Buffy that he has lived hundreds of lives and trained countless slayers. But in the comic, Merrick explains that he was born and raised to be a watcher and that he had previously trained five slayers before Buffy and watched all five of them die. In the pilot episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, when Buffy is in Principal's Flutie's office talking to him about her permanent record, he mentions that she burned down the gym at Hemery High. Well, in the movie, Buffy doesn't burn down the gym. They amend that in the comic by having her lock the gym with a bicycle chain and setting it on fire with all the vampires inside. The comic book's ending does a little segue into the show it ends with Buffy's former friends, Kimberly, Jennifer, and some other people sitting around a pool and they're talking about Buffy. They talk about how she got expelled from school and her parents got divorced and she skipped town and went to Vegas. Well, it turns out that she went to Vegas with Pipe. In the next story in the comic titled Viva Las Buffy, it tells the tale of her in Vegas with Pike and the adventures that they have. The end of the comic is Buffy in the library with Willow, Giles, and Xander, and she's basically telling them this whole story of what happened to her at Hemery High, and they ask about Pike, and she tells them it's a story for another day. I think it's interesting that both schools have pigs as their mascot, at Hemery High, it's the Hemery Hogs, and at Sunnydale, it's the Razorbacks. Uh, I don't know what the obsession is with pigs. They also had to change some things because in the film, 
Buffy is a senior in high school, but in the show, she starts Sunnydale as a sophomore. I think they were just trying to have a fresh start. So aside from a few differences, it's basically the same story as the movie. However, it's a little bit more menacing. The art is a little scarier, and I think they try to invoke the intention of the original script is that it was supposed to be scary. It was not supposed to be a children's film for nine-year-olds like myself at the time. In my humble opinion, I don't believe that the cast and crew are to blame for the initial failure of this film. I think that Fran Kazooie is to blame, but she doesn't take any of the blame. Fran Kazooie blamed the low box office numbers and the marketing and how it was received. She blamed all of that on the fact that the film was released during the Olympics. And she thinks the film would have done better if it had been released in October, closer to Halloween. It's my belief, personally, that this film suffered because of Fran's lack of guidance. She blames the fact that they didn't have that much money. She blamed the fact that they had a, a tight schedule and that they didn't have a lot of time and that they didn't have time to rehearse. But if you're going into a tight film shoot and you don't even have a shot list and you're just kind of making up the shots as you go and letting the actors do whatever they want, it probably won't have that great of a turnout. There's probably not very many movies where the director just pissed in the wind and it turned out great. She didn't accept any input from Joss Whedon. She didn't listen to Fox Studios when they were making requests on ways to improve the film. And she just did whatever she wanted to do. So I do think that she needs to own up to some of the responsibility for this movie not initially doing well. Eventually the film did find an audience because the TV show sparked new interest in the film and now it has a cult following. And I think a lot of that has to do with some of the moments in the film that I really found amazing when I was watching it as a kid. Some of my favorite scenes are Paul Rubens. You ruined my new jacket. Kill him a lot. Admit it, Buffy. Aren't there times when you just feel less than fresh? And the scene where Buffy ties the ribbon in her hair and she goes and lays in bed and Lothos is there and she doesn't realize he's there, that was really scary to watch as a nine-year-old. As for me, I've loved this movie since I was nine years old and it will always hold a special stake in my heart. Thank you everyone so much for watching this video. This is probably one of the longest videos that I've ever made and I will be making more. I'm going to go into the unaired Buffy pilot and talk about that. I have a lot of research to do on that video, but I'm excited to do it because I'm learning things that I didn't even know about previously. And it's, it's, it's exciting for me to know that there is more to learn about a series and a universe that I have loved since I was a little girl. Like, subscribe, share this video, and get in the comments. Tell me what you think. Did I leave anything out? Do you guys know something that I don't know? Please put it in the comments because I love finding out new little nuggets about the Buffy series that I never knew before. So please share it all, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!